my name is Bridget von Preussen and I'm speaking to you from the University of Oxford in the UK, where I'm a junior research fellow at Christchurch. And I'd also like to introduce my co-organizer, Charles Kang, curator of 18th and 19th century drawings at the Rijksmuseum, who's joining us today from Amsterdam. It's a huge pleasure to welcome and re-welcome so many of you here today from across the world. Um, and we really want to thank you so much for joining us for these seminars and for all of your questions and comments which have made this series so rich and productive. Um, we'd also like to thank everyone at Torch and at Christchurch who helped to make this series a reality. So before we get started, um, we just wanted to touch on the future of this seminar series because we really hope this won't be the end of the road. We're actually running a small in-person workshop on the same topic in Oxford in a few weeks time and I hope to be able to share the results of this with you in the future and as of next week you'll be able to find the talks from this online seminar series on the Torch YouTube channel so if you missed any of the series or if you want to share the links more widely please do look out for them there. Charles and I are also really hoping that we'll be able to run a second season of this seminar series in the autumn um, and we'd be really grateful for your comments and suggestions to help us shape the series going forward so please do drop us an email. And similarly if you would like to be added to our mailing list for future events please let us know because we can't um, just do a mass email for um, data protection reasons. Um, so please reach out to us, we're going to put our email addresses in the chat box and we'd really love to hear from you. Okay, so preamble over, let's move on to the reason why everybody's here today. Um, I'm so honored to welcome and introduce our speaker, Lewis P. Nelson, who is Professor of Architectural History and the Vice Provost for Academic Outreach at the University of Virginia. He's a leading scholar of the built environments of the modern, early modern Atlantic world, and he's also the primary advocate and representative for community engagement, public service, and academic outreach programs across the University of Virginia. Professor Nelson's publications include The Beauty of Holiness, Anglicanism and Architecture in Colonial South Carolina from 2008, Architecture and Empire in Jamaica from 2016, and the co-edited book of essays, Charlottesville 2017, The Legacy of Race and Inequity from 2018. And his current research engages the spaces of enslavement in West Africa and in the Americas, where he's working to document and interpret the buildings and landscapes that shaped the transatlantic slave trade. He also has a second collaborative project working to understand the University of Virginia as a landscape of slavery. His talk today is entitled Neoclassicism and the Architectures of Race. And after the talk, Charles will be moderating questions, so please put them in the Q&A box for Lewis. So please join me in welcoming Lewis Nelson. And it's over to you, Lewis. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you very much, Bridget, and thank you, Charles, as well, for inviting me to be here. I've had the opportunity to pop into a few of the previous uh, seminars, presentations. Uh, this has been a very exciting series, and I'm actually going to be uh, with you in Oxford uh, in a few weeks. I'm really looking forward to the opportunity to continue that particular conversation. Um, I am so grateful to have the opportunity to present here, as I was just sharing prior to um, us stepping into the public version, a uh, public portion of the session. Um, uh, I had initially planned, uh, when I was first asked by Bridget and Charles, to present here to uh, do some continuing work on my uh, work at the University of Virginia, which you will be introduced a little bit to UVA here. Um, but uh, recently have been confronted by a building I had not experienced before uh, and started to think about um, uh, how neoclassicism and race functioned in that particular building. So I'll be spending a little bit of time with, uh, with some new work. So before we jump into the presentation, I just want to ask, uh, well, just to say, this is the first version of this, and I'm actually going to be reading a written paper, uh, which I wouldn't normally do, uh, but that's because this, these ideas are all sort of hot off the press and brand new. Um, and also, I'll just uh, just want to point out this, uh, the PowerPoint presentation that I'm going to be presenting is also brand new. I have not had the time to uh, sort of put uh, proper titles or citations uh, repositories on there. So um, please understand that the PowerPoint uh, that I'm about to share, which I'm happy for you to review later, um, is also very much in an early draft and not yet properly, uh, properly cited. So let me just begin with that uh, acknowledgement and uh, beg your indulgence uh, as we move, as I move into kind of new territory uh, for us here. But with that, let me go ahead and share my screen. That is great. Okay. 
Well, thank you so much for this invitation. <clears throat> and here we go. In 1818, as he was developing his ideas for a new university in his home state of Virginia, Thomas Jefferson articulated that the purpose of the new university was to form statesmen, legislators, and judges on whom public prosperity and individual happiness are so much to depend, to develop the reasoning faculties of our youth, enlarge their minds, cultivate their morals, and instill in them the precepts of virtue and order. Now, this university was intended to be shaped by the radical principles of enlightenment learning, where pupils would sit under the tutelage of a master, each in his own pavilion, in a collection of buildings that Jefferson characterized as an academical village, likely inspired by the model of such a village described to the ancient Greek philosophers in the Encyclopedia Methodique. And of course, Jefferson intended that the new university would exhibit models in architecture of the purest forms of antiquity, furnishing to the student examples of the precepts he will be taught in that art. This, of course, would become the University of Virginia, where I now teach, a complex of late neoclassical pavilions, all organized around a central library, a rotunda modeled on the ancient Roman pantheon. As Jefferson imagined a new university dedicated to educating citizen leaders for the nascent democracy he helped to found, the ancient worlds that birthed both democracy and republicanism were for him the obvious architectural incubators. But what does not often get said explicitly in this compelling founding story is that Jefferson never imagined that this university opening would open its doors to people of color. He believed whites and blacks in America were to comprise, quote, separate nations. And he notoriously concocted plans to ship all African Americans beyond America's shores, first to Liberia and then later to Haiti. Born at the intersection of Enlightenment education and the classical tradition, Jefferson's new university and the nation it supported was for Jefferson and for so many others for whites only. Increasingly silenced since the civil rights legislation of the 1960s, Jefferson's commitment to national racial purity burst from the dark corners of the web with a fury on the night of August 11th, 2017. Chants of blood and soil made explicit these men's familiarity with the long tradition of violent white supremacy and their choice of stage was no accident. Through these theatrics, they wished to reclaim a political promise of Jefferson's classically inspired vision for a white America. This paper seeks to unpack that history, to explore with care the intersection of neoclassical architecture and the history of enlightenment racism in three episodes. Each will offer a critical premise that when bound together help us better understand the marriage of neoclassicism, racism, and the politics of nationhood. Before we begin, however, we need to pause for just a moment to understand the construction of race in this period. There are two major contr contributions that shape the way most Enlightenment naturalists and their readers understood race by the late 18th century. The first was the French naturalist Georges-Louis Leclerc, the Comte de Buffon, who in his 1753 Histoire Naturelle offered the definitive definition of a species. He argued that animals are all the same species if they can crossbreed and their offspring can also procreate. This became known as Buffon's rule, a widely accepted premise that made clear that all human beings were the same species. Just five years later, in, eight, in 1758, Carl Linnaeus published the 10th edition of his monumental Systema Naturae in which he asserted that the genus Homo was comprised of two species, Homo troglodytes, the apes, and Homo sapiens, men, the latter of which he asserted had four natural varieties derived from four different continents, America, Europe, Asia, and Africa. To each of these varieties, Linnaeus assigned discrete social, physical, cultural, and personality markers. Following Thomas Aquinas' great chain of being, Linnaeus elevated Homo sapiens over Homo troglodytes, 
and organized the former into a natural hierarchy, beginning with African and then Asian, American, by which he means Native Americans, and all organized under European. As a result, by the late 18th century, most Enlightenment thinkers believed that all human beings were one species, this part was true, and that, the, and that, the, and that they occupied a natural hierarchy with Europeans at the top and Africans at the bottom, just above apes. Furthermore, the establishment of race as a category burdened with social, moral, and even physiological uh, conditions directly informed contemporary aesthetic theory. Edmund Burke, for example, in his famous 1757 treatise on the philosophical inquiry into the origins of our ideas of the sublime and the beautiful, a name we all tripped over in graduate school, um, found that blackness, here explicitly including the black body, was a physiological source of terror and therefore a source of the experience of the sublime. Not quite the antithesis, sorry, the antithesis of beauty, but certainly not correlated with virtue. As enlightenment naturalists undertook the work of constructing racial categories, aesthetic theorists began the work of signifying white as virtuous beautiful, and beautiful and good, and also black as dangerous. Thus, the same decades that saw the emergence of academic neoclassicism were also the decades that generated the construction of race as a pseudoscientific category with enormous physiological, social, moral, and aesthetic consequences. To begin our first episode, I'd like to introduce you to an important but little known contributor to academic neoclassicism, James Dawkins. After graduating from Oxford, Dawkins undertook a grand tour. But unlike those before him, Dawkins organized an expedition from the Italian peninsula to Northern Africa and the Eastern Mediterranean, ending at the as yet undocumented ancient cities of Palmyra and Baalbek. Leaving from Naples in the early summer of 1750, Dawkins was joined by Robert Wood, an experienced traveler and scholar of classicism, and Giovanni Bora, an architectural draftsman. In the preface to his eventual publications of The Ruins of Palmyra, Robert Wood reports to his readers that he agreed to company, accompany Dawkins because of his patron's love for antiquities. They traveled in the Matilda, a ship fitted out in London with a full library, including, quote, all of the Greek historians and other books of antiquities, as well as mathematical instruments and presents for the Turkish grandees who Dawkins expected would serve as local hosts. The party toured Egypt, the coast of Asia Minor, the Levant, the Aegean, places where, quote, architecture had its origins, recording inscriptions and taking mar marbles with them, quote, whenever it was possible, end quote. Architecture, Robert Wood reported, took up our chief attention. By March of 1751, the expedition had reached the ancient ruins of Palmyra and Baalbek. The Voyages Journal suggests that Dawkins was not just a traveling patron, but the expedition's leader, an engaged scholar and a passionate recorder of ancient sites. Wood, in fact, reports that Dawkins was so indefatigable in his attention to see everything done accurately that there is scarce a measure in this work that he did not undertake himself. After documenting those sites through carefully executed measurements, the expedition then left for Greece. In June, the team arrived in Athens, where they encountered James Stewart and Nicholas Rivette, who by then had been at the project of documenting ancient Greek ruins in that city for three months. After a few days in Athens, Dawkins and Wood traveled with Stewart throughout the region, eventually returning to Athens for a thorough investigation of the ruins there. Stewart captured those investigations in his drawing, which you see here, Nicholas Rivette, James Stewart, James Dawkins, and Robert Wood, at the funerary monument of Philippopolis, eventually published, of course, in the Antiquities of Athens. Leaving Stuart and Rivette to their work in Athens, the team returned to Naples by the late summer of 1751. Upon their return, Dawkins offered critical financial support to Robert Wood to encourage his publication of their findings, which ultimately appeared in both English and French as The Ruins of Palmyra in 1753 and The Ruins of Baalbek in 1757 offering both systematic um, recordings of ancient, of ancient ruins beyond, sorry, offering the first systematic recordings of ancient ruins beyond the Italian peninsula, 
Both volumes include detailed architectural drawings of sites and remains that had been previously unknown in Britain or on the continent. The books established a model against which all arche later archeological work would be compared. Robert Adam acknowledged as much in the introduction to his own treatise on Diocletian's palace. As a result of their commitment to accurate documentation, Dawkins and Wood, together with Stewart and Rivette, laid the foundation for the modern fieldwork in classical archeology. span While in the midst of these two projects, Dawkins also offered generous financial support to Stewart and Rivette to complete and publish their archeological work on Athens. The two men returned to England in 1755 and actually lived for some time in Dawkins' London townhouse. The lengthy list of subscribers at the beginning of the first volume of Antiquities of Athens names those patrons who purchased more than one set of the eventual three volumes. As evidence of his extraordinary support of the project, James Dawkins alone was listed as purchasing 20 sets. Both friend and patron to James Stewart, Dawkins appeared to have purchased also a large number of the gouches painted in preparation for the publication of Antiquities. These efforts earned Dawkins great renown and election as a fellow of the Royal Society and nomination as a member of the exclusive Society of the Dilettanti. In 1755, Dawkins planned an overseas trip and in preparation, he drafted a will. The most notable line of the will allows for 10,000 pounds sterling, a lavish sum, to construct a new house on his Southampton estate to be designed by his good friends, James Stewart and Nicholas Rivette. Such a commission in 1755, had it been realized, would have resulted in the first country house designed in the new Greek taste. He also left 100 pounds per annum to support Robert Wood. And finally, 500 pounds was to be dedicated to the erection and support of an academy of painters, sculptors, and architects. Dawkins died two years later. And upon his death, the world of antiquarians mourned. No less than Johann Winkelmann proclaimed that his death was a loss for the arts and sciences. And soon after his death, Gavin Hamilton was commissioned to represent Wood and Dawkins' landmark ex exhibition in paint, which you see on the right. The two toga-clad intellectuals are drawn toward the ruins while a turbaned African attends to the horse. While maybe unfamiliar, Dawkins' biography is not entirely surprising, except on one point. Dawkins was Jamaican. Born a British Creole on the Caribbean island and then educated at Oxford, Dawkins was the principal heir to an estate of 25,000 acres of sugar plantations, mostly in Clarendon Parish on Jamaica's south coast, which collectively yielded a gross income of 60,000 pounds sterling per annum. Dawkins' capacity to fund his extraordinary exhibition, support Robert Wood's publications and those of Stuart and Rivette, depended entirely on the brutal slave regime of sugar production far away in his home colony of Jamaica. Many hundreds of enslaved Africans perished on sugar plantations named Aleppo, Palmyra, and Parnassus. And actually I found Parnassus in the middle of this map on the right-hand side, which I should have reviewed ahead of time. Somewhere in the middle on the right, you'll see the marker for the plantation Parnassus. <coughs> Excuse me. Many hundreds of enslaved Africans perished on sugar plantations so that Dawkins could help birth classical archeology span and launch the publications that would have a profound impact on academic neoclassicism through the later 18th century. And therein lies our first principle, that neoclassicism was, was an aesthetic tradition born of the wealth of empire, rafted on astonishing greed and the uncritical perpetuation of a slave regime, justified through racist assumptions of natural black inferiority. The white columns of Athens rendered on the pages of antiquities were born from the blood of an unending stream of discarded black lives. One of the earliest and most articulate expressions of this new Athenian classicism in Northern Europe was of course, the Brandenburg Gate. Designed in 1788 by Karl Longens, a Prussian architect, the gate is an explicit reimagining of the Propylaea, the gateway to the Acropolis, rendered, rendered in detail in volume two of Antiquity of Athens, published just one year before. So much so, in fact, that after its completion, uh, Car uh, Johann Karl Richter mocked the design as simply a copy. 
Even the equestrian monuments discussed in the antiquities as once associated with the Propylaea became reimagined by long hands as the bronze quadriga ushered in, ushering in the allegorical figure of peace on, in, into the city on top. Significantly, the Brandenburg Gate was the first architectural commission by Friedrich Wilhelm II, just two years after his elevation to the throne as King of Prussia. And its severe classicism signaled a dramatic departure from the Baroque aesthetics and the prevailing Francophilia of his uncle, Frederick the Great. The commissioning of the Brandenburg Gate was part of Friedrich Wilhelm's larger program of ceasing military expeditions, improving roads and canals across Prussia, eliminating state-held monopolies, reducing taxes, and encouraging trade. He also elevated German as the state language, overturning his uncle's preference for all things French. The rigorously neoclassical Brandenburg Gate, immediately distinguishable from the uh, distinguishable from the public and private architecture of the Baroque expression under Frederick the Great, signaled the arrival of a new political regime. Significantly, the gate faces towards the city, its intended audience Berlin's citizens, not to the outside as one might expect. And it is in this frame that the Brandenburg Gate is generally understood, architectural evidence of the rise of a peace-loving Germanic monarch withdrawing from the legacy of his belligerent and Francophile predecessor. But there's one feature of the Brandenburg Gate that suggests a slightly different reading. While the metopes of the Propylaea in antiquities, as you see on the left, are blank, those of the Brandenburg Gate are filled with a centauromachy, each square showing a contest between a man and a centaur. The famous source for this visualization of the ancient story of the Lapiths and the centaurs comes not from the Propylaea, but the south elevation of the Parthenon. In the ancient story, the Lapiths are descendant of the vigilant and heroic Lapithes, and the centaurs descended from his brother, Centaurus, who being deformed and bestial in nature, had mated with a mare to produce the line of the centaurs. Reconvening for a wedding feast, the centaurs become drunk, which amplified their bestial nature, lusty and belligerent. The valiant Lapiths, engage the centaurs, defending the honor of the bride. Contrasting virtue and vice, order and chaos, the centauromachy on the Parthenon alluded to the virtuous Athenians and the belligerent Spartans. But what of the figures on the Brandenburg Gate? Who were the Lapiths and who were the centaurs? The beautiful, heroic, and virtuous figures of the Lapiths were certainly intended to reference white Germans. But what did that mean in the years before and after the Brandenburg Gate? It is hard not to see the Lapiths through the lens of the Foundations of the History of Mankind, published by Christoph Meiners just a few years before the Commission for the Gate. In that volume, Meiners departed from earlier racial categories to classify only two, the Tartar Caucasian and the Mongolian. The first, beautiful, strong, and virtuous, would in later editions become just Caucasians. The latter, the Mongolian, was weak, lacking in virtue, and ugly. By the early 1790s, just after the gate was completed, Meiners began to concentrate on intra-European and even intra-German comparisons. In the first, Meiners always found Germans more, faithful, more favorable than dirty white, non-German -Euro non Europeans. Germans, he argued, enjoyed racial purity. And by the closing years of the century, Meiners even argued that Northern Germans, inclusive of citizens of Berlin, were purer than those from South Germany. Meiners' work also had political implications as he made clear his disdain for the French Revolution, unfolding in exactly these same years, for its undermining of hierarchies, social and cultural hierarchies, and especially its desire to include Jews as citizens of the French state. Published first in 1785 and soon widely popular, published in three editions and translated into several languages, Meiner's writings were rising in popularity with the growing German middle class in the same year that the commission for the Brandenburg Gate was extended to Longens. It seems not insignificant that the Brandenburg Gate was the very first commission funded by Friedrich, uh, Wilhelm Friedrich II, just after he sought to win over the German middle class 
by reducing taxes, improving infrastructure, and replacing with French with German as the courtly language. If the Lapiths were white Germans, newly identified as Caucasians, who were the Lapiths? Sorry, who were the centaurs? Through the lens of the writings of Meners, they were all non-Caucasians. But there were other German race theorists writing in these very same years. Just a decade after the design of the Brandenburg Gate, sorry, just a decade before the design of the Brandenburg Gate, the German philosopher Immanuel Kant published on the different races of men in 1775, in which he confirmed that all men were of the same species, but that there were different races, hierarchically disposed according to morals and to reason. This conviction built on his explorations of racial categories, which has surfaced in observations of the feeling of the sublime, of the beautiful and the sublime, published the previous decade. In observations, Kant argued, the Negroes of Africa have by nature no feeling that arises above the trifling. Mr. Hume challenges anyone to cite a single example in which a Negro has shown talents and asserts that among the hundreds of thousands of blacks who are transported elsewhere from their countries, even though many of them have been set free, not a single one was ever found who presented anything great in art or science or any other praiseworthy quality. So fundamental is the difference between these two races of men. And it appears to be as great in regard to mental capacity as in color. Longhens, the architect of the Brandenburg Gate, was a known admirer also of Johann Winkelmann, who in the same year as Kant's observations, published his own monumental treatise on the history of the art in antiquity. As so ably explored by Anne Lafont in our previous seminar, Winkelmann, like Burke before him, trafficked in the assumed physiological and aesthetic inferiority of blacks. He writes, among the reasons for the pe peculiarities of Egyptian art, the first has to do with the appearance of the Egyptian people, which did not have the excellence needed to inspire the artist to ideas of high beauty. For nature was less, fav less favorable to them than to the Etruscans and to the Greeks. The Egyptians, moreover, were of a dark brown complexion. While the centaurs through the lens of meaners might well signify all others, all non-German uh, others, in this moment of racial scientific history, it was the Africans who occupied the tier of humanity just one step removed from Homo troglodyte, the apes. In the minds of many Berliners passing through the Brandenburg Gate, the centaurs might well have been Africans. Just three years after the publication of, by Christopher Meaners, or Christoph Meaners, Karl Longens installed on both fronts of the Brandenburg Gate a series of metopes that clearly evoked an ancient story of the competing descendants of two brothers, one noble and virtuous, one deformed and immoral. The conflict pits human strength, beauty, and virtue against subhuman degeneracy. The emerging racial theory just then shaping the public imagination assumed that physiological form and morality were inextricably mixed and also immutable. Therefore, the Lapiths were born into virtue and the centaurs born into depravity. It is possible, of course, that the Berlin centauromachy is nothing more than a convenient transfer of sculpture from the Parthenon to the otherwise unornamented Propylaea. But given the renewed interest in the biological history of Homo sapiens, the assumed phys physical, intellectual, and moral supremacy of the newly defined Caucasians, it is hard not to see the Brandenburg Gate metopes through the lens of emerging scientific racism. And it is also not insignificant that this ornamented, that this ornamented a major gate into the city, an edge, the edge that separated the order of the city from the chaos of the wilderness, an edge that defined the boundary of citizenship and the moment that filtered citizens from aliens. And here is our second premise. If the story of James Dawkins reminds us that neoclassicism was inextricably linked with the economies of empire, the West African slave trade and the brutalities of plantation slavery, the Brandenburg Gate reminds us that neoclassicism and scientific racism are siblings, overlapping and at times interwoven domains of the late 18th century enlightenment.
In our final episode begins also in 1785, when Thomas Jefferson disembarks in France to begin his five-year term as ambassador plenipotentiary. Upon his arrival in Paris, Jefferson's very first visit the next day was to the naturalist Georges-Louis Leclerc, the Comte de Buffon, the previously mentioned author of Buffon's Rule. While Jefferson wished to engage Leclerc regarding a different debate, that of the youth or antiquity of species in the Americas, which had been characterized by Buffon as his theory of new world degeneracy, something you can imagine that Jefferson contested quite robustly, Jefferson also engaged with Leclerc on debates around race. In a manner quite consistent with Linnaeus, with Kant, with Minkelmann and others, Jefferson wrote in his Notes on the State of Virginia, published the year he arrived in France, that same year, that African-Americans are lacking beauty, emitting a very strong and disagreeable odor, where in reason, inferior, in imagination, were dull, tasteless, and anomalous, participated more in sensual activity than in reflection, never conversed in thought above the level of plain narrative, and were never seen producing an elementary air, sorry, an elementary trait of painting or sculpture. Knowing very well Leclerc's conclusion that all humans were of the same species, Jefferson found racial difference in physiognomy, intellectual capacity, aesthetic sensitivity, and moral acuity, not so much in racial categories, but in racial capacity, and for his purposes, for participation in democracy. Rather than arguing for different races, although he certainly assumed that, Jefferson argued that blacks and whites in the, in the new United States were in fact separate nations. This is an important distinction because in Jefferson's mind, a sustainable democracy depended on a well-educated populace. If African-Americans were physiologically, intellectually, aesthetically, and morally degenerate, they could not become full citizens prepared to sustain a healthy democracy. In this, he was quite aligned also with Winkelmann, who had decades earlier argued, in Athens, a democratic form of government was adopted in which the whole people participated, the spirit of every citizen soared and the city rose above all the Greeks. As good taste was now widespread and as wealthy citizens sought by means of splendid buildings and works of art to inspire the respect and love of their fellow citizens and to pave the way to honor, everything flowed into this city with its power, greatness, and uh, like rivers into the sea. Special thanks again to Ms. Lamont who pointed me in that direction from a previous seminar. So when it came to designing a first new Capitol building for the Commonwealth of Virginia, and then decades later to design a new university for his, name, for his nascent democracy, Jefferson naturally built in the guise of the ancients drawing on the very best models of antiquity, which he saw as exemplars of, quote, virtue and order, end quote. The selection of a classical architectural style tied Jefferson's architecture, as historian Mabel Wilson has demonstrated, to an enlightenment tradition that assumed and even justified a natural hierarchy among the races. And that hierarchy directly shaped his view of a democratic citizenry. And here is our third premise, that the interdependence of aesthetics and virtue most clearly articulated in the public architecture of Thomas Jefferson visibly reminded all who gazed upon its white columns who could and who could never enjoy the protections of citizenship. How then are neoclassicism, race, and nation building interconnected? Neoclassicism was born of the violence and exploitation of empire. It matured as an interlocutor with scientific racism, and it was, and it was deployed in the post-revolutionary era as a visual reification of citizenship. And these interdependencies became deeply inscribed in the buildings that cemented their legacies. Remind oh. Sorry, that was supposed to be up there on that final point, I skipped an image. Remember that the Brandenburg Gate became a favorite stage for Hitler. The night that he was appointed chancellor, 
thousands of torch-bearing Nazis marched through the gate. His later disciples did exactly the same in 2017 here at the University of Virginia. In the long arc of the architectural tradition in the global West, neoclassicism from the era of revolutions to the present carries with it more or less articulate ways, the material memory of white supremacy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Louis, uh, for such a rich talk. And uh, there's just so much uh, <laughs> that I'm very eager to engage with. Um, and thank you again also for sort of venturing into some uh, new materials and introducing us to these. And uh, I think it, I, I expect a very stimulating discussion coming ahead.